Hello, my name is Dr. Liz Burton Crow. I'm the Director of Education for the Carrillo Center for Nonviolence. Welcome back to Living One. It's been more than a year since we first launched Living One, our monthly webinar series where presenters from around the world share their vision of a future in which all animals are treated with respect and dignity. A lot's changed since we first began these important conversations. Given all that's currently unfolding in the world, today there is no denying that animal wellness and self-determination are linked to our own well-being. We speak these days of getting back to normal, which begs a larger question. What do we want that new normal to look like and how do we get there? To help us answer that question, this month we're welcoming Stephen Wise, founder and director of the Non-Human Rights Project, which litigates to obtain civil rights for non-human animals. He has taught animal rights jurisprudence at nine law schools, including Harvard and Stanford. Stephen is the author of 23 law review articles and four books, Rattling the Cage Toward Legal Rights for Animals, Drawing the Line, Science and the Case for Animal Rights, Though the Heavens May Fall, the landmark trial that led to the end of human slavery, and an American trilogy, Death, Slavery, and Dominion Along the Banks of the Cape Fear River. Interviewing Stephen today is our very own Dr. Gay Bradshaw. Well, everyone, welcome. It's been quite a week, if not a year. And uh, as uh, I have to say, you know, Steve, when we asked you to speak on November 8th, I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> what's that going to be like for you, you know, right after the elections? And I think it's absolutely perfect. Uh, and my, I don't have a first question, but Give us some thoughts on what this sort of roller coaster has been from your perspective and what you see is unfolding. As, as Liz said, you know, we were sort of, we framed this uh, webinar series to get the conversation beyond knowing what's wrong to sort of talking about what is right look like. And then with all of the, you know, convergence of these literal global uh, events, um, and then more recently in our country, which has tremendous, you know, influence since we're global across the, the, the whole planet, um, we're sort of in sort of coming catapulted into, you know, what is the new normal? What are the kinds of visions that we have? But before, please just give your thoughts. I, can you hear us, Steve? I cannot hear you, Gay. Or I'm I'm hearing a little bit of you. Oh. Am okay. I the only person who's not hearing Gay? Or? Um, I could hear her, so it could be an internet connectivity issue. Oh, okay. Um, but oh, basically, okay. she was just asking sort of for your thoughts on all that's um, happening with the election and what this could potentially mean. Ah. Yeah, it's been kind of a whiplash I, I year, <laughs> you know, we, with these events, you know, with the COVID and uh, the, the internal <clears throat> effects of the United States, which have had global effects and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're sort of back to what, and probably in one, uh, some perspectives is kind of normal, but obviously the new normal is not the old normal. Well, I, mean, for, for, uh, I, I, I can answer both, you know, as the, as the uh, founder and the president of the Non-Human Rights Project, and then just as, as, mm -hmm. a, as a normal citizen, uh, I mean, obviously, maybe not obviously, but as a normal citizen, uh, you know, what's gone on over the last year or so has taken up, you know, a, a great deal of my attention uh, as, as uh, we, we work to see how we deal with the COVID problem. You know, as far as I'm concerned, how we deal with the Trump problem, you know, how, and how we deal with all the problems that 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 come from Trump, including environmental issues, climate change issues. Uh, now, uh, however, as far as the founder and the president of the, New, uh, the Non Human Rights Project, um, we've uh, we've hardly blinked an eye. We have just uh, continued to move as fast as we as we always moved. Uh, we are a you know, we've all we have always been a virtual organization, so. So right now we have uh, uh, we we have one person in in Portland, Oregon. You know we have one in the Bay Area. We have uh, two in Los Angeles. You know I'm in Florida. I'm actually three in Los Angeles. I'm in Florida, and we have uh, uh, one person in Denver and New York City. So we're very used to working virtually at, you know, as an organization, and uh, we just kind of continue to push push forward. 
uh, no matter what's happened. So the COVID really hasn't hasn't affected the way where we work, except to the fact that um, uh, usually I'm not home for more than three or four weeks, and I'm out somewhere around the world working with people. And now uh, I haven't really been anywhere since since uh, February. And uh, and you know I, I believe I lose I lose something uh, uh, when when that's that happens that I don't get to to sit down with people around the world and really have in depth conversations and that that uh, that's been a loss um, you know, I still teach uh, and in some ways I actually um, I do better teaching on uh, on Zoom than than even in a classroom because uh, for one thing people are all facing me uh, on on Zoom and I find that to be to be really helpful. Uh, but what I don't get is being able to speak to my students before class, speak to them after class. Uh, I can't tell you, I can't go out to lunch with them. And, you know, we can't go out to dinner. Uh, the places where, where, you know, human relationships are born. Um, I don't think they're born very much on Zoom. Um, and also, I've been, you know, I've been involved in a lot of conferences. People have asked me, I guess it's really cheap to ask me to be on a conference. It doesn't cost them anything uh, to, to have me have me speak. And I've been doing that. Uh, and so I go on, I, I and I, I, I speak on a conference, uh, but I, you know, I speak, you know, maybe for 15 minutes or half an hour or an hour, and I speak into a, you know, in, in basically into a blank screen, and then I go off. I don't even know if anyone heard me, uh, which is uh, uh, not as uh, not as fulfilling or as constructive as if I was in a room, you know, with 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 several hundred people, and then afterwards we could sit down and really talk about anything. Well, the, you know, I think that COVID, just to bring that, bring the sort of a loop on that, is that it's more data in terms of um, the diseases and the connection. That uh, It's more data that we're all connected, however you want to look at it. And I also think, or do you think, um, that COVID by, its, the, by animals uh, in this role as such, really repositions and elevates, quote unquote, animal advocates and animal rights um, in more of a, an arena of authority. I mean, they are the ones who, for example, for farmed animals, and we're seeing with the mink, that um, a lot of the animal rights and, and advocates are really the people who know a lot of the detail of the machinations of the exploitation industry. So do you see that animal advocates and animal rights will be, be more um, playing a, 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 you know, more central role in terms of how the, the future unfolds and policy making, et cetera? Well, I, I have seen at least one major example of that. Uh, you know, the, uh, not so much in, in the United States, but the Non-Human Rights Project uh, has been working with um, with lawyers and others around the world, and we're we're preparing to file a lawsuit in Israel. We're preparing to file another lawsuit in India. You know, we're we're working with um, with uh, other folks in other parts of Asia, in in Latin, in South America, and where judges are more willing to apply what they would call an ecocentric point of view rather than an anthropocentric point of view. Mm -hmm. they're, when they're talking about what what the place of a non-human animal is, or what the place even of a river is, or the Amazon rainforest is, and so there, there was excuse me, <coughs> there was a case that came down uh, in May of 2020, just just a few months ago, in the Superior Court in Islamabad, um, uh, where uh, there was a judge who was um, who who ordered a uh, an, an elephant named. Kavan to be transferred to a sanctuary and ordered uh, all the animals actually uh, th that were in a zoo to be transferred out of this out of the zoo. But people were focusing on Kavan on the elephant, and the judge began by talking about COVID, by talking about we're living in a COVID world, a post-COVID world, and uh, taking a more ecocentric view of of. Uh, where non-human animals should fit in 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 the whole world, and that and that that clearly uh, had a uh, a distinct influence upon his decision. Mm -hmm. And and what about um, I mean, most of the work with uh, your project, and correct me, uh, are dealing with when you mention those different cases. Are those all mm -hmm. elephants, or I mean, if, or if you're at liberty to to discuss, are those all elephants? Uh, uh, right now, we are 
they, and, and the cases coming up in um, in Israel and in India are going to be elephants. We're also uh, filing a lawsuit. California are likely going to be elephants as well. Um, but we're also, you know, I, you know, I've been talking, you know, uh, publicly about you know, to SeaWorld and to others. And you know, when when we're able to uh, to bring a lawsuit against SeaWorld on behalf of workers, we're going to be doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we always look for other lawsuits involving uh, involving great apes. Um, as we continue to move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, trying to establish certain principles of law uh, that. Uh, that that apply to you know to to these kinds of extraordinarily cognitive, uh, mm -hmm. cognitively complex and, and 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 autonomous beings, but we we never argue that uh, that uh, say being autonomous or being cognitively complex is a necessary condition for rights. We just argue that that it's a sufficient condition for rights, and that if we can prove to a judge that our client is autonomous and exceedingly cognitively complex, then she should have rights. But we don't. We, we never argue that that uh, that kind of complexity is a necessary condition. There, mm -hmm. there may be and almost certainly are other grounds for giving rights to a, an array of non non human animals. It's just not uh, just just not the ones that we're working on right now. Mm -hmm. um, what about would you have any consideration? You just said you weren't. But for a farmed animal, which is, uh, you know, again, very close to the, 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 the whole COVID issue. Mm -hmm. Well, it's unlikely that we that at least in the United States that we would be bringing any lawsuit up soon, you know, on farmed animals. And in fact, uh, uh, that's kind of a third rail, you know, in in our litigation. Uh, when whenever we bring a lawsuit on behalf of any non-human animal, so far elephants and chimpanzees, one of the major ways in which the opponent tries to to uh, uh, persuade the court to rule against this is to make a slippery slope argument saying, judge, if you free this elephant and send her a sanctuary, then pretty soon they're going to, they're going to come back with arguments about, about farming and we're all, you, we're, you, they're going to be asking you to order that, that everyone be a vegan. And so therefore you should not take that first step. And, and uh, we, you know, we're not sure how, how, uh, Persuasive those arguments are, but we see them uh, in 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 the, in the happy the elephant case uh, in January of 2020 when we were arguing in the Bronx, uh, they actually had people come in who were arguing that um, if the judge agrees to release Happy from the Bronx and send her to sanctuary, then we're going to be we're going to destroy the New York dairy industry, and they, you know they, with a straight face they made they made that that sort of argument, and uh, the judge we uh, did not buy that argument, but. Uh, uh, that's one they make. We 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 lost a case in um, Connecticut where an appellate court said, um, "I don't believe that you're just trying to bring a lawsuit on behalf of an elephant. If we rule in your favor, then any animal is going to be able to bring a lawsuit about anything, and you're going to destroy our entire legal system." So when we choose which non-human non-human animals in these years to uh, you know, to represent in court, we we have we have to be very careful. But it. That's basically what the science says, that a cow or a rabbit um, is, you know, from the neurosciences and neuropsychology, it, it, the same as an elephant. So in a, well, sense, in a sense, that's the, the, the foundation of the science, you know, to, that, that speaks that. that they, I, I don't know whether the judges or the, the ones <laughs> that are making the complaints actually are aware of that but that's certainly what the science says so there it's not only a slippery slope it's a level slope <laughs> you know? well in the in the in the in the judge's minds it's it it it, it can be a slippery slope um you know the you know, science and law are not necessarily the same thing right uh, you know, uh, law is going to have issues of science also issues of, of other all sorts of public policy uh, all sorts of um of moral issues, potentially you know, philosophical issues, uh, sometimes religious issues, even though in the United States, religious issues generally are not talked about literally, but they're, mm -hmm. they're oftentimes going to be in, you know, in, they're going to be in, in the back of the mind of many of the judges. And of course, all of the judges who are sitting on the bench were all influenced by, by many things. And one of them could be by their religious um, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, 
it's not it's not just science. You know, it's science, policy, ethics, religion, philosophy. So litigating one of these cases can can uh, uh, be very complicated. Well, what does your project respond to when someone says, "Well, if we you know give personhood to happy, um, which means other elephants, um, and that's a slippery slope for you know the dairy business"? What what does your project? What do they? How do you phrase it? How would we reply respond, to that? Important? How do you respond to that? Well, what we would say is that uh, there there is, isn't any evidence of that that's been placed before the court, that this case is about this elephant and the experts that we brought are all elephant experts. So all we're doing is talking about elephants. We're not talking about anything else and any other species. There, there's no facts upon which upon which a judge you know, could could appropriately rely outside of elephants because no one has raised raised that issue in fact in 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 one of the uh, of the cases that 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 we did lose because of they thought that we really were uh, going to then uh, that, that that if they ruled in our in our favor with respect to elephants at that point uh, uh, any non-human animal could bring a lawsuit on behalf of anything in Connecticut um, and I, I did not know they were going to to come to that conclusion and I warned them against coming to that conclusion in oral argument when to my surprise we started talking about dogs we started defend tigers and i didn't know why we were talking about dogs and tigers and uh, i told the court i didn't know why we were talking about dogs and tigers because uh, there was no evidence about either dogs or tigers that had been brought before them at the at the either the trial level or the appellate level so i can't i can't start acting as an expert dog witness or an expert tiger witness i'm just a lawyer uh, and there wasn't any evidence. So what happened is that you then sometimes, as I think happened there, have judges who then use their own their own biases about things. You know, there's some kind of partial knowledge that that they might have that that we don't have access to. Uh, mm -hmm. So we uh, we have to just there say this this case is about elephants, and the one re and one one of the sequelae of that is that the only evidence that's been presented to the court is about elephants. Everything else would just be speculation. So let's not go there in this case. They decide to go there in this case anywhere, anyway, based upon who knows what. We, we, we don't have any idea. And uh, they aren't the first judges to do that. And we understand. Um, we believe that uh, many of the judges before whom we, we appear uh, have um, you know, at least an unconscious bias against what, what, what we're doing that uh, no non-human animal has ever had a legal right in uh, the 2,000 years in which there have been rights. So they've grown up um, with kind of a you know, wallpaper uh, of non-human animals are things. They, they don't have rights, and they'll, they will have an unconscious and perhaps sometimes even a conscious bias against the, the arguments we make. So we have to uh, try to figure out, you know, who, you know, who the judges are who are sitting in front of us, what kind of biases might they have? We all have biases. I do, you do, judges do. And, and we, we can't pretend that, that we're, we're computers here and we're not, we're not human beings dealing with each other. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, part of what we're doing is just standing up in front of judges, as what I'm doing, trying to understand uh, who am I dealing with? You know, what kind of biases, might, either conscious or unconscious, might they have? Uh, when they ask questions, what are they getting at? Um, and sometimes I'm pretty good at it, and sometimes I'm apparently terrible. <laughs> I'm sure you're not. Well, oh, I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I did not learn in law school was how to mind read. Well, <laughs> you're close to it. Um, what was the what were the reasons for choosing elephants, orcas, and great apes to to shape your first initiatives? Uh, well. One one reason is that those non-human animals um, have, you know, extraordinary are extraordinarily cognitively complex beings. Uh, a second thing is that, um, well, actually, this this is part of the first is that when we when we spend a lot of time trying to make make those kinds of decisions, we put aside. Uh, any ideas we might have had as to what arguments we might think were important or what values we think the judges ought to have. And instead, 
we would spend a lot of time trying to understand what values do the judges actually express in their written decisions, uh, which may or may not reflect what they actually believe, but that's the best we can do, again, since, since we're, we're not uh, mind readers. So one of the things that, that we saw is that at least within the United States, and this may not be true in India, may not be true in Israel, may not even be true in all, all of the states, but so far it, 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 it seems that way, that uh, they value uh, autonomy. They believe that a significant part of their work as a judge is to protect the autonomy of human beings and allow, uh, allow humans to be able to act in any way they want as long as uh, it doesn't do something you know, un untoward. And one of the examples we give for, uh, is that um, um, you might have a, a human being who's in a hospital who doesn't wish to live, or they they're having an operation and they're, they they say we don't we don't want a blood transfusion. We'd rather die than have a blood transfusion. And uh, hospitals would go to courts and they would say uh, we want we want to get uh, judicial permission to transfuse this person with blood. And the the uh, the person who's having the operation would say um, you know say I'm a, I'm a Jehovah's Witness or whatever. I don't want a transfusion, I'd rather die. And the judges began to rule that the person's autonomy trumped their, their own life. So autonomy was more important than life. And so we then use that as an, as, as an example of a, of a fundamental value that the judges in the jurisdiction hold, which is that they value autonomy. Now, until we show up, the only autonomy they've ever valued is the value is the uh, autonomy of human beings because they've never had a non-human being or someone representing her come before them. And we go before them and we say, you value autonomy. You know, we're not going to give you our opinion about what we think, you know, how we think you should, you, you know, what, how we think you should value or what you should value. We're just saying, this is what you do value. And so if you value autonomy, then we're going to place autonomous beings before you and argue that it's not the species that you're valuing. It's the characteristic of the species. It's the autonomy that you're valuing. And so you should be no less eager to protect the autonomy of any autonomous being in the world, including our client, uh, as well as well as a human being. So, yeah, so we use that argument and then we go about trying to locate um, autonomous beings. So we, we uh, you know, we, we speak to scientists. I spend, a, I have, I have to have a, a science degree myself as an undergrad. So I don't have any problems, you know, you know, speaking to people, to, to scientists. I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, studying beings I think who might be autonomous. I visit them. I read their scientific articles and find out ultimately can, and ask them, can you write an, you know, an affidavit that will state that our client is an autonomous being, explain what an autonomous being is and why she is autonomous. Then we go into court and uh, and our our case, our, the, the legal part of our case, will to a, a certain degree then revolve around the fact that we have proven and we can prove that our client is autonomous, that you, the, the, the court, values autonomy, uh, both as a matter of liberty and as a matter of equality, and that, that we should be able to then um, free our client from imprisonment because uh, through a writ of habeas corpus, because what, a, what habeas corpus does is protect autonomous beings who are being deprived of their ability to self-determine. And we would say that's what's happening to our clients. So we should be able to use a writ of habeas corpus uh, to be able to, uh, to, to free our clients so that she will be able to exercise uh, the autonomy that she could do it, uh, say, in, in a sanctuary. Or one day we can bring her, you know, you know bring them uh, into the wild. I think that was a long answer. I hope it made some sense. No, it's, uh, it's good to hear all the, all the inner workings. <laughs> Um, just a point is, and again, this is all of biomedical sciences, is, <coughs> as you know, that, that, that I basically have called trans-species psychology, is that mm -hmm. an elephant and an orca or a, a chimpanzee or a gorilla is no more com cognitively complex than a fish or a rabbit or a tortoise uh, or, or any Mm -hmm. Any of the definitely um, that just and, and those are the neuroscientists that, you know, Robert Sapolsky, um, who's mm -hmm. you know, quite well known. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that foundation, um, in other words, it seems to me what you're saying is that, that the elephants and the orcas and the chimpanzees, those choices um, really are perhaps, I'm not, I don't want to make an assumption here, perhaps mm -hmm. because they are viewed as very charismatic to the public mm -hmm. and they are viewed and to the as, judges. as something exotic. However, it seems to me, and again, I'm not an attorney. My uncle was the Arthur Corbin, the contract law, but that's oh, really? as close as they got. Okay. Um, is is that why not why not start at the foundation of of what science says? Because there's such a powerful uh, now, even with COVID, I mean, see, it, there's a momentum of showing that um, they're all the same. They're, they're, the brains are variations on the theme, and even going into you know insects and all. Um, do you feel that that would just be an impossible battle or do you think um, you're going to run into problems, you, not we, you know, <laughs> but mm -hmm. legal cases will be, you know, in the future when, and I do believe when you do get a personhood case successfully, um, then are you going to get stuck in, in this sort of thing where it says, well, you know, this rabbit is not you know, is not cognitively as complex as the elephant. So in other words, is that, do you see, how do you see that unfolding in the future then? Well, that, I mean, it, it, that's, that's um, happening in the United States, right? I mean, we're, we're using the arguments that we think uh, will be able to have the best chance of winning in the United States because um, we use more of an anthropocentric model uh, in the United States than than, than happen in other countries. Um, but about other countries we're working in, for example, uh, India um, has used pretty like an ecocentric model. And uh, the Indian Supreme Court in 2014 ruled that all animals, literally all animals, have both statutory and constitutional rights uh, in India. Now, the question is, what you know, what does that mean? Because when I go to India, I don't notice that it's any different mm -hmm. uh, than uh, than what we know when I'm in in the US which is which is one one thing that one of the reasons where we're bringing a lawsuit on behalf of an elephant in India uh, we instead of um, you know instead of of looking at at a uh, at, at a top-down um, Supreme Court case where you have you have the Supreme Court of India saying look all animals have these constitutional and, and, and statutory rights and we're not clear how that works or what they mean. So instead, what we're going to do is bring a habeas corpus case on behalf of a single elephant and saying, we would like to, to set up the procedures and the arguments, you know, for how this work, how this work can works. Can we, can we then uh, move, you know, uh, get, get you, the judges uh, to agree that this particular elephant has this particular right. And as a result of that, we, uh, she can be ordered freed and then moved to move to a sanctuary and then when that happens we can then instead of kind of uh, instead of trying to work from the bottom down we then begin to work from the top up talk about well what other rights might elephants have what other rights um might other non-human animals have but uh, uh i would suggest just as a matter of the way human beings work that you need to try to figure out what the psychology is uh of of the judges before whom you are appearing uh, and uh, when you see how hard it is for us in the United States to persuade a judge that an elephant should have should be able to have a single right, or a, uh, a chimpanzee should have a single right, uh, you would uh, you would not consider bringing a lawsuit on behalf of other non-human animals who you realize uh, they wouldn't they would they wouldn't consider it for a second. Would we just be uh, we just be um, wasting our time and all and also setting. Um, bad precedent. So we, we want to win. We don't want to lose. That that's just what we lawyers right. do. Right. That's how we so, are. So when when personhood does occur for happy or whomever, mm -hmm. I mean, um, already it's already happening in other countries. You have you have Cecilia chimpanzees been right. moved to a sanctuary in Argentina. Um, uh, Chucho the uh, the uh, spect spectacle bear. Has had a long kind of roller coaster uh, uh, case in which I think she, I think she won, she lost, she won, she lost. I think she's, I think she's on. Uh, I think the last time she she lost, 
but uh, but you you saw clearly that other some of the lower judges were sympathetic to her, and that's something that's really important. Same thing with uh, Sandra the orangutan, who both won and lost cases. The last case she lost, uh, but that but you could see that there are other other judges who are sympathetic to her and wanted you know wanted her to win. Um, plus, you have not only the issue of judges. Uh, you have the issue of, of legislatures, of parliaments. Um, you know, what you, uh, we, which is one of the reasons why you have to be thinking of what what is not just the idea, the, the feeling of the judge, but what about you know the the jurisdiction as a whole. For example, um, under the common law, under uh, which is you know the the law of you know, English speaking countries, um, we could conceivably uh, you know have uh, say the New York. Court of Appeals, the highest court of New York, say as a matter uh, of the common law, you know, our our elephant, you know, has a right. And the next day, the New York legislature could go in and say, no, they don't. Young people, only entities who can have rights are human beings. And so we have to we have to try to make sure that that does not happen. Um, that's one of the things, if you recall, that that happened in the gay marriage cases. Is that is that when they when when the litigators would win a gay marriage case, the the, the legislators would step in. Or they would get uh, uh, proposals on the ballot, and uh, they would lose their victories. And and uh, th- that that is is almost certainly going to going to happen. And so we have to uh, be ready to deal with that uh, because what we're dealing with, you know, is not you know is not just it's just not a legal thing. It's a psychological thing and a f- philosophical thing and a political thing, a historical thing. You know, it's. It's it, it's very complex to to uh, uh, to try to win social justice movements. Are there parallels in you know you wrote that book on on that particular case of slavery? Yes. Are there? You know, could you just talk a little bit about that? And sure. Uh, unless I don't think everyone's read your book, or maybe they have. What? Okay. <laughs> well, in that case, we'll, we'll um, change. We'll change that. <laughs> So, so um, <laughs> I wrote I wrote a book called uh, "Though the Heavens May Fall" in 2005, which was, by the way, you know, it was it was reviewed on the cover of the Sunday New York Times book review, and uh, which shows that somebody has interest in you know in, in it. And in it, I told the story of how human slavery was ended in England, you know, through the through the use of a of lit- litigation. So there was there was a case that was filed, and uh, on behalf of James Somerset, who was the slave uh, against his master Charles Stewart, Somerset versus Stewart, and I set out the background of you know of, of the uh, of of all of the the, the the humans who were important to the case, um, you know, and Lord Mansfield, who made the, the the judge who made the decision, and 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 what what were the political and historical things that were going on, you know what. Uh, Underneath of everything, and showed how uh, someone could use a common law writ of habeas corpus, you know, to to essentially move an entity there, a black slave, from the uh, from the status of a thing to the status of a person. And uh, he he came in a slave, and he came out as a, as a as, as a free man. And uh, we actually, um, in the Non-Human Rights Project, um, you know, base our litigation on that case. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, and and interestingly for us, it's it's not necessarily an, an English case. It was decided on uh, June twenty first, seventeen seventy two, but virtually every state within the United States absorbed the common law of England as of some date, maybe the fourth of July, seventeen seventy six, maybe maybe seventeen eighty one, when maybe when they came into the Union, but the, but they absorbed the the English common law, which means that the the Somerset case was was decided by by um, the King's Bench in England, but it's become part of the common law of virtually every state. So when we argue about Somerset versus Stewart, say in a New York court, we're pointing out that act- that's actually now a new, you know, part of New York law, and that mm-hmm. court should think about um, what Lord Mansfield was doing. You know, we, we we talk about what Lord Mansfield was doing. Now, sometimes any of you any of you who've seen our HBO film. Um, Unlocking the cage, um, you can you can watch me in front of an appellate court where I just mention uh, the Somerset case on a, really on a procedural matter, 
on a, on a procedural ground, and the, the judge starts to get all bent out of shape. She's, she, she begins to imply that I'm a racist, com, that I'm comparing chimpanzees to, uh, to human slaves, which, of course, I'm not. We are exquisite, exquisitely sensitive to that, and she had to really go out of her way uh, to kind of make that implicit a- accusation. Um, she's one person who's done it. Uh, on the other hand, um, the judge in the happy case uh, and who wrote a wonderful, wonderfully supported decision and who allowed us to argue for, for 13 hours over three days, which is the first time a judge had really let us make our, you know, our complete argument. And, she, and, uh, and you can, if you read her decision, you can see that, that she said she, that we were extremely persuasive and she ruled in our favor everywhere she could. She felt she, that, that she was bound by another case uh, that we had lost six years ago in, in another part of New York. And that's what we're really fighting, fighting against now in the appeal. But you know, for our purposes, you know, she was a black woman, black female judge, and uh, didn't seem to bother her at all. Uh, and uh, she listened to our Somerset, our Somerset arguments for what they were, which is that we weren't obviously, we were not comparing elephants to black people. We were talking about the same principles of law that apply and have applied to the, what we call, we, we argue, is the irrational discrimination against black people, against Native Americans, against women, against children, uh, against all, you know, all kinds of, 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 of humans over the years, and, and uh, how slowly those are being overcome, and that uh, they, should, they should apply those same, that same kind of thinking to our argument concerning our non-human animals. Do you feel that the the sort of the major shift and um, I would say sort of pulling back the covers um, with Black Lives Matter and uh, various other events and openings, uh, kind of a truth, time for the truth period, which I see is a really positive. Do you feel that that is going to have any effect in terms of the animal rights movement? You know, it's hard. It's hard for me to know. Um, I, 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 again, there are some people who get bent out of shape because uh, they they feel that uh, that that folks who are arguing for non-human animals to to have rights and rely at all upon uh, cases involving the uh, involving slaves, for example, that that that's a terrible thing. We must all be racist. There are some people who, no matter how many times I explain what we're doing. Uh, uh, don't view it that way. Um, I remember uh, David Brian Davis, uh, who is a pre was a, a very famous um, historian of slavery and, and abolition. I have about five of his books, you know, in, in one of my bookcases behind me. Probably twenty years ago, I was I was uh, I was working with him, trying to get him to to uh, to to support our work, and he finally said. You know, I really like your work. I, I just I just can't support it, you know, because I'm so I'm so uh, sensitive to the history of hundreds of years where people have uh, have have compared black people to apes, and and I just and and I know you're not doing that, but it just makes me so uncomfortable, uh, and so I understand that that can happen to people, and it probably will continue to happen to people, uh, but. Uh, Obviously, when we see some judges, we know it's not happening to them, and it shouldn't happen to them because we 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 are again very sensitive to that, and we never go anywhere near making that comparison because we think it's a false comparison, and uh, and it's just not helpful. But there are some people who are so sensitive again to the uh, to the centuries of comparing black people to apes that they can't get past that, and so. You know, when we run into judges or legislators who are like that or others, uh, they may not like us, even though they're making a mistake, they're misunderstanding us. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, once the, um, once kind of a, the zeitgeist, say, of truth-telling or, or, you know, being, you know, entities who, who deserve freedom should have freedom, uh, we, we say, well, we have entities who are our clients who deserve freedom and they, they should have freedom. And for oftentimes much the same kind of similar reasons in, in, in kind of a broad way. 
And, you know, we, we, we tell the judges now, I, I, in, in our brief, we say, look, um, black people were, were irrationally and, and unjustly deprived of their rights. Women have, children have, uh, Native Americans have, I say. And why do we need to do the same thing with, with non-human animals? And for the same reasons, they were as irrational and they're as, they are as irrational and immoral as applied to our clients as they were when they were applied to to all these other these other sorts of humans. Why why don't we skip going going through the through decades of biased decisions? Why don't we get past the bias and do the right thing now? We're hoping some will. Well, it seems to me that we've entered in not necessarily willingly. I mean, depending on who you are. Um, just to call it from a paradigm of dualism, you know, cutting pe- cutting things up literally um, and parsing things into non-dualism. And so uh, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, divisions don't make sense anymore. If you look at, you know, transgender and you look at gay marriages and, uh, you know, in other words, there's it's not possible to, to categorize effectively <clears throat> anymore. Now, obviously, not everyone agrees. But it seems to me uh, that there's been a huge social and cultural um, emergence of what we would call non-dualism. And that's also happening within the spiritual traditions. So, you know, you're getting um, the Pope, you know, and rabbis and um, Mm -hmm. other Buddhists, et cetera, uh, talking about mindfulness, um, talking about love and um, you know, dealing with these messy things like gay marriages or whatever, you know, whatever have been the sort of the, the backbone of many of these um, traditions. And so, <clears throat> you know, that that you're getting these kind, in fact, I just read an article, I think it was the BBC. Um, it, it may be more, I sent it to a colleague of mine in South Africa, and it may be more common, but basically um, uh, two tribes are being evicted um, from the parks in, in Kenya and so the elders got together and I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but basically they're saying, look, how about this? How about we use our traditional methods? Okay. <laughs> you know, in other words, we're in charge. We use our traditional methods because they worked. Um, and in other words, sort of reappropriating what, what is called um, conservation. So um, in other words, the colonial conservation. So it seems to me that the, 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 the ground, the baseline um, of dualism and uh, colonialism um, is really evaporating and disappearing. So from that perspective, um, it would seem like making these kinds of arbitrary decisions, plus as you've talked about social media, I mean, there's so many people, I mean, it's like burgeoning, you know, where people are understanding like my octopus teacher. I mean, there's this visceral right. shift right. on a personal level as well as on a collective level. So to me, that's really making an impact and, and a very different, it's a sea change relative to quote unquote, where we were. Well, you know, we, we think that we are in a transition period. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're actually uh, have been moving along much faster than we predicted that we would move along. We're mm-hmm. actually only in our sixth year of, of filing cases, and we filed mm-hmm. nine of them. We're about to file five more this year, and um, we you know we're running into in, into judges who seem to agree with us, mm-hmm. and uh, and we weren't expecting that for quite some time. We've actually run run into a lot more than we than. We, we had expected, um, you know, but you also run into something else, which is that even judges who agree with you, they have to be certain kinds of judges. They have to be ones who, who are not afraid to be the first person to do something or the second person to do something. Um, okay. I, I remember when one of our very earliest cases, uh, and by this, by the way, all of our, all of our transcripts are online. One, one of the judges was, was saying, Wow, this is you know these are, are really great arguments, but I'm not going to be the first to take this leap of faith. Mm-hmm. And that's a quote, and you know we understand you know some judges um, may want their picture on the front of the New York Times tomorrow. Some judges may not want their pictures on the front of the New York Times tomorrow for this, and some judges may not care you know whether they are or whether they aren't. And so uh, there's you, you definitely when you're when you're litigating cases. 
you're not litigating them in front of a computer. You're litigating them in front of the human being with all the messiness that all of our human beings bring, you know, to all of our endeavors. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we, we never can, can forget that, that, uh, uh, you know, this is not a computer. This is a human being who we only have the slightest idea as to what, you know, their world has been up until the moment that we met them in the courtroom. And that's why we, uh, can walk away with so many different, you know, sorts of responses to the same arguments. Now I know I'm I I'm going to squeeze in one more question because <laughs> I know people are eager to to okay. ask you questions and discussion. Um, but I I guess the thing is is that from my perspective, um, we're and this has to do with COVID and it has to do with climate change and the mass extinctions. It really seems to me that there's such widespread you know, it's not homogeneous, okay, but there's another, like another level, sea change, as I would call it, in terms of, um, as you call it, ecocentric, and in terms of uh, wanting, this is the sort of the sub-question, is understanding, and the fact this was even talked about with the election, is that activism is really, we are activism, you know, I mean, the whole point of it is being active and participating in, uh, in a society. And I think that's a really important um, message that has come through. And I, I personally see that that it's important to, to bring to the fore, not just scientists and professionals in, in the sort of more formal way, but people who work with rescue and sanctuary uh, because they are the ones that are really at the interface and the understanding of the epistemes and ontologies of the individuals that you are, um, you are promoting and defending or mm -hmm. speaking for. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the United States seems to um, seems to have a much more anthropocentric um, history or background or culture. Um, you know, we're, we're you know we're we're seeing in in Latin, in South America, especially in Asia, um, uh, judges and legislatures who are much more willing to to be biocentric or ecocentric even if even if uh they're enacting uh you know constitutional amendments that say nature has rights now i don't know whether that mean, means anything or not uh but it, it it might be just kind of some kind of a formalistic way of beginning to 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 get that idea across but uh you know now you have uh you know india there was a judge who who gave the, the ganges river rights bangladesh supreme court gave all rivers rights new zealand has given uh a national park rights the uh, the wanganui iwi river uh rights um colombia the, the constitution interestingly enough i'm talking with this with a colleague the uh, constitutional court of colombia gave the Amazon forest rights, but then it wouldn't give Chucho the spectacled bear rights. So I'm so I said to my colleague who's trying to think about the, you know, what's going on in the intersection between environmental law and and animal law, I said, you know, think about that. Why why would what's going on when a court gives the Amazon rainforest rights, but won't give, you know, one of one one bear rights? Uh, what what does this mean? And I uh, I, I don't know the answer to what it means, but it means something. It's and means continuing, something. and and at the same time, continuing to assassinate indigenous um, indigenous activists. Well, you did. <laughs> yes. Well, there are the, the, there's a difference between um, doing something that's illegal and trying to establish the illegality in the first place. Mm -hmm. so right now, you can't. It's illegal to assassinate human beings. It's, it, it's crimes. It doesn't mean it's it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't happen. But right now, it's generally not illegal to kill non-human animals, and that we're trying to establish um, their rights not to be killed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Steve. I'm going to stop being so selfish and and uh, turn this over to. Uh, I thoroughly have enjoyed and, it so far. No, no, no. I I know that there are. I'm sure many people have some questions. Well, I am ready to take up. Oh, I'm. I, I see some. But um, how do you want to how do you want to work this? Well, thank you both for the interview. Um, before we stop the recording and go to the Q&A, I just wanted to make a quick plug uh, for next month's Living One webinar. So that will be on December 6th. We'll be joined by Gwenna Hunter of Vegans of L.A. So thank you so much, Steve and Gay, uh, for taking the time.